got to tell you, at Robinson Park this morning with Layla's baptism, there were tears in there, lots of tears. Layla was sharing from the tank and burst into tears, and then Graham, her dad, as he was baptizing her, burst into tears, and I said, you know, tears are good things. Sometimes we hide them, sometimes we bottle them up, but tears, whether they come from pain or whether they come from joy, are opportunities for God to break into our lives and to do some good work. Nothing wrong with tears. Pray with me as we start this morning. We bless you, Lord, for just the opportunity we've had already, whether around our tables in conversation, whether singing, whether, Lord, celebrating with Layla as she's baptized. Lord, so many things already this morning, this incredible video. And now we open up your word and we long for your spirit to teach us and to transform us. So let my words not get in the way of your words as you want to change us so that we walk in your ways and the world sees who you are. We bless you for this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So good to see you this morning and to be back. I don't know if you were here last week, but... um, Last week, I introduced myself as Peter, so it's good to see you again. And I'm honored. I got to tell you, I'm so incredibly honored to be able to, anytime people ask me to talk about the 12 of us, you know, these 12 ordinary guys, I know people at times will build us up and they'll sort of platform us and think of us as spiritual saints, but my goodness, if you knew of us, we're just ordinary blokes, I'm telling you, ordinary to the core. Some of us didn't even finish school, right? Well, I told you a little bit about myself last week. You know, Peter, uh, but that name came from Jesus because he changed my identity, called me rock, pulled all the stuff out of me he could, changed my character. Boy, that was a lot of polishing he had to do. Changed the very purpose of my life. I mean, to go from fishing, which is Okay, it's not a bad career. (laughs) But to go to joining with him in redeeming the world. I mean, come on. Fishing's good, but not not that good. And then I told you about Andrew, my brother. Incredible man of faith, Andrew was. Jesus would say something, and what would he do? He'd just do it. then, Then I told you about the fact that he never, ever was resentful. I, could, I can't get over that, really. I mean, he lived in my shadow his whole life and, and, and often was excluded from the big three, as we kind of jokingly called ourselves. But never did he resent it. Always saying positive things about people. But by far the best thing about Andrew, the thing that I love to talk about, about, about him the most, little people, big people, doesn't matter what, He was always, always, always bringing them to Jesus. There's ten more of us. And I want to tell you about two more this morning, if that's all right with you. Two more, two more brothers, uh, partners with us in fishing. I want to talk about James and John. And, And my hope is that in telling you a little bit about James and John, that what will happen is some of that stuff, that Jesus did in them will will spill over on all of us. And he'll use their stories to transform us. You know, if any of the disciples could get away with not being called just ordinary, maybe it's James and John. I mean, they came from an incredible family, really. Zebedee was their dad. They were known as sons of Zebedee. Not because he overshadowed them, but because people knew who he was. He'd done okay in business, made a little bit of money, not upper class, but maybe a little bit more middle class than some of the rest of us. But he was also connected to some of the religious elite of Israel. He could open doors. In fact, you know, on the night that Jesus was arrested, a number of us got into the courtyard where Jesus was, and that that was because Zebedee. And James and John being his son. You know, they were privileged in a sense, James and John, because of Zebedee. 
they also were a little bit entitled at times. We'll, we'll get to that in a minute. Their mom, Stallone. Boy, she was great. Ever present. Sometimes I thought it was always to care for us, which I think she was doing. But I knew underneath there was a little bit of her trying to, she just wanted to be with Jesus. I mean, who didn't? Zebedee and Salome, these parents of James and John, in a sense, adopted the rest of us. I mean, they made us m m meals at times. They took us in. They cared for our needs. And to grow up in that household, boy, they did have some good things going on, James and John. Sons of Zebedee, these fishermen. You know, they were aggressive, these two. They were tough. But they had this sense of zeal in them, this fire burning deep inside, this fervor. And most of the time it was good. But Jesus had to reshape it. Well, let me tell you a little bit about James first. Born in Galilee, he was the older of the two boys. Fisherman, as I've said. Part of the big three. You know, when you, when you saw James, you knew immediately there's the raw materials. There's the right stuff in James to be an amazing leader. My guess is if I hadn't been on the scene, he would have been more prominent over and over again. James needed to be shaped. He needed to be molded, remolded, I guess is a better way of saying it, transformed into the person that, well, that the Father had intended him to be from the beginning. Let me give you two examples or two characteristics of James that I, I think Jesus was busy working at all the way through. The first has to do with power. See, James was a tough guy, right? And whenever there was any kind of thing that went against what he wanted to do, he didn't want to take no for an answer. And he would sort of, you know, puff his chest up and sort of be ready to go. And Jesus saw it and wanted to reform that. See, James would want to do things in his own strength. That's why Jesus gave them the names of sons of thunder. There was always this violence, this volatile nature in them. You know, Jesus gave me the nickname as Rock. Why? Because he wanted to pull something out of me that I had sort of, you know, uh, squashed. But with Sons of Thunder, what's Jesus doing? He's giving them a nickname that, in a sense, curtails them. In a sense, sort of puts a lid on. Okay, okay, I get it. You can do all that. You're the big man now. Great. But, you know, just pull you down a peg or two. That's who James was. This deep sense of power. And there was this scene that happened. Luke tells about it in his gospel. The scene that happened when Jesus was leading us, we were on our way to Jerusalem to celebrate at one of the festivals and to worship with God's people. We had to go through Samaria. And so what does Jesus do? He sends two of us ahead. And we needed a place to sleep. We needed a good meal, a place to wash up, all that stuff. And he sends two ahead. And when we get there... Instead of a warm reception, what do we receive? Well, I suppose what we should have expected. I mean, the Jews and the Samaritans hated each other. Hated each other to the core. I mean, we thought they were sort of, they sold out to culture. They started worshipping in other places and worshipping sort of a culturally uh, shifted kind of God instead of the one true God that we knew. And to be honest, they hated us too. There was no hospitality for us. We went into this area and we were accosted by these Samaritans. And James did the old James son of thunder thing. Puffs up his chest and, you know, bronzes his shoulder and he's, he's ready to take him on. He says, Jesus, shall we call down fire? Take care of these people. Now, I, I know to some that sounds a bit peculiar, but we knew what was going on. You see, this area, this area of Samaria, it was well known to us Jews. Something incredibly famous had happened on this spot centuries before. Had to do with Elijah, one of the sort of heroes of our faith. Elijah had been there and um, 
the king of Samaria. Well, the king of Samaria had had a great fall, and he fell through a lattice and really badly hurt himself to the point where they weren't sure if he was going to live or not. So he sent some of his sort of messengers to go and, and go to, you know, sort of a pseudo-God and find out, will he live or not? Our God comes to Elijah and says, Elijah, I want you to go to the king and his messengers and say, why are you going to a fake God? Why are you going to a, a pseudo-God when you could come to me and talk to me about this? So what does Elijah do? He does exactly what God's asked him to do. And he goes and he takes this prophetic word and he goes, what are you doing that for? You can imagine how the king received that. Who are you to talk to me that way? So what does he do? He sends 50 of his best men to go and capture Elijah, to bring him back so that they can kill Elijah right in front of him. So the 50 go. They go with the best commander of the army. And they find Elijah sitting there on top of the hill, and he's just waiting. And the commander comes up and he says, you know, Elijah, uh, if you're a man of God, why don't you come with us? And Elijah, probably a little smart aleck, he says, well, if I am a man of God like you say, I'm going to call fire down out of heaven to destroy you. And at that moment, guess what happened? Fire comes out of heaven and they're disintegrated. Well, the king hears about it and he says, this can't be. So what does he do? He goes and he sends another 50 people, another 50 of his best men with another commander. And same story. So the king says, this can't do. And he goes and he sends a third group of 50. Now this commander... He's a little wiser than number two. He comes to Elijah and he says, Elijah, have mercy. Now, there's a lot more to the story, but this is the place where that happened. And now what James does is he says, hey, Jesus, should we do that? <sighs> He's not Elijah. I mean, who does he think he is, Really? Thinking he can put himself on the same sort of level as Elijah. That he has this kind of power to call down fire. But what was worse? What was worse was the fact that he'd missed what Jesus had been teaching the whole way through. That Jesus and the kingdom of God are not about a, a power where we come up and over and against somebody. No, it was not a power or a kingdom of violence. It was a completely different kind of kingdom. It was the second thing that James did, not just this distorted sense of power that Jesus needed to fix, but well, it was all about position. There was this time. You can imagine us, right? Thirteen of us walking on the road. You get in little groups and you start to have side conversations. And, and one of the days we, we saw James and John walking with Jesus. They were mumbling. We couldn't hear. We were a little ways behind. But we sure found out what, what they'd said. Remember, they came from a, from a family that had a little bit of you know, prestige in the community. A little bit of position. And, and now they're coming to Jesus and saying, Hey, Jesus, you know, because of who we are kind of thing. And, and the, the passion and the zeal and the fire that's in us. Why don't you put one of us on the left side of your throne and one of us on the right side of your throne when you go and sort of set up your kingdom in heaven. We got so angry, so upset with them. You know why? Because we were thinking the same thing. No, not about them, but about ourselves. We just didn't have the courage to go and do it. There was always this sort of, you know, vying for place, vying for position, this pecking order sort of thing. What does Jesus do? He comes back to us and he says, oh, you guys have missed the whole point. This isn't about a pecking order. No, he says, the kingdom of God is where the first shall be last. You know, that that the world thinks is the best will be least. It's upside down. But friends, there was one more thing that he said to James in the midst of this. Can you drink the cup that I'm about to drink? At the time, we didn't know what it meant, but we do now. We, we do now that Jesus has gone through all that he's gone through. 
He was asking them, look, you have no idea what being in this position actually means. Can you die the death that I'm going to die? And they so quickly answered out of that zeal, right? Out of that, that fervor that they could do it. Jesus says, well, you will. But where you're going to sit, that's not up for me to decide. That's up to my father. Jesus spent those three years with us, and we just saw this incredible shift in James. It wasn't about his power anymore. It was about the power of God, especially when the Spirit came upon us. James went and he took the good news of Jesus to all kinds of far places. And about this positioning or posturing, well, James did drink the cup that Jesus drank. I don't know if you know, but he was the first of the 12, well, other than Judas. He was the first of the 12 to be put to death for his faith. See, Jesus took his zeal, his, his passion, his fervor, and he, he changed the direction of it. He, he redirected it so that instead of it being for him, it's now for the kingdom. I want to tell you about John, but let me catch my breath for a minute and let us respond a little bit in the midst of that. Let me give you 30 more seconds. sure a lot better than all the sounds of rumors that I've heard. The rumors about John being a mummy's boy. I mean, I, you know, I've even seen sketches of people drawing where they sort of have John, because he's one of the youngest, sort of resting on Jesus' shoulder, looking up at his eyes like some, you know, <laughs> far from the truth. John was a man's man. He was a fisherman. He was big. He was rugged. You should have seen his hands. And he had the same zeal and fervor and passion as his brother. I mean, he was called the son of thunder too, you know. No, he was no mummy's boy. Jesus saw the, the longing for power in James and John and gave them servanthood. Jesus saw the longing for prominence and gave James death and John a long, long life of serving. Jesus saw the desire for them to rule. James was executed and John was exiled. John was born in Galilee as well. He was the younger of the boys. He had the same privileges as James did. Same sense of entitlement, to be honest. There was a zeal in him. He was part of the big three, the inner circle. And, and can you imagine, just for a minute, I, I mean, the stuff that we saw? I, I mean, just think for a minute of, uh, of being there on the mountain that day when Jesus was transfigured, his glory revealed. I mean, that, that has an impact on anybody. Or, or when Jesus comes and he takes Jairus' daughter's hand and she's dead. And he brings her back to life. Or that night when he's arrested, they're in the garden and he's weeping. Crying out to the Father. I mean, just the wails, you know, they got deep inside of us. And then, and then you saw him and, and sweat turning to blood. I mean, all these things shaped us over these three years. There's a couple things that, you know, as I said with James, Jesus saw raw material in us. 
didn't change us in the sense of giving us new raw material, but changed and shaped and formed and transformed the stuff that was there into stuff that he would use for the kingdom. John was known as the apostle of love. That's hilarious. At least it would have been at the beginning when you first met him, right? Like all that stuff, all that anger and fervor and zeal that was all there. He was there with the Samaritans just like James was. Outsiders. We don't want any of them. Anything to accept love wrapped up in that. And then there was this other, other time, this other scene where John comes to Jesus. We were all there. We saw it. And John goes, like, puffs up his chest as if he's really proud and says, hey, guess what I just did, Lord? There was this guy over there. He was casting out demons. I sure told him. I rebuked him and I said, look, you don't belong to us. You're not part of this. Stop it. Oh, I wish he'd never. I, 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 I bet you he wished he'd never said that. Jesus corrected him right there on the spot, right in front of all of us. Gentle, mind. Oh, John, would you go do that for me? Anybody that's doing stuff in my name, why would you stop them? John was known as the apostle of love, but Jesus had so much work to do in him to get him there. He was transformed. My guess is he saw Jesus model this for him. Of course, that had to be part of it. The number of times that Jesus would meet with opposition and yet still talk with love. He heard Jesus teaching. But my guess is what really, what really got John, what really changed John, the moment was we're having, you know, the Last Supper, Passover meal. And there we are. And what does Jesus do? He takes off his outer garment. And he goes around the table and he starts washing our feet. And he gets to the end. And what does he, what does he say? A new command I have for you. Love one another as I've loved you. By this, everyone will know. You're my disciples. that that hit us all of course but i know how much it hit john he was transformed he became this unbelievable pastor oh so many of us went out and told the good news to people who'd never heard and john did some of that too but more than that john john followed in footsteps like he followed in paul's footsteps and took over the church in ephesus and and pastored these people. And I, listen, I knew these people. Some of them were, they're a little crazy. You needed all kinds of perseverance to hang in with them. No, old John would have told them what for. New John. He was a great pastor. Loved them. Cared for them. And it wasn't just in in being there present physically with these people. He, he wrote. I mean, Paul wrote so much, but John was right behind him. Out of anybody that wrote, John wrote second most. And you don't need to read more than five or six minutes of John, and you know exactly what his themes are. From one end to the other, what's he talk about? Love, 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 love. No wonder he was known as the apostle of love. What good is it if you say that you have love? You say that you're following Jesus, but you don't love the other because you're a liar. There was a second thing about John. He was the apostle of love, but friends, he was the also known as the apostle of truth. Huh. How does that work? That wasn't really changed in him. He was always one that sought after truth. That's why he followed John the Baptist in the first place. He wanted to know the truth. And when John said, look, the Messiah that takes away the sin of the world, he was off like a shot. 
There's the one that has truth. Somebody said about John, he was so black and white. Kind of as if, if, as if he would phrase all of life in this kind of sentiment. You're either in the light or you're in the dark. You're either alive or you're dead. You either bear fruit or you're barren. You either have love or you have hate. You're either in the kingdom of God or the kingdom of the world. You're either a child of God or you're an alien. You either obey him or you disobey him. You either on judgment day are received or you're denied. Oh, no, John was after truth. Paul would write things, you know, he'd go into great big explanations, but John, no, straight to the point. He's at the heart of the issue. This is the truth. He loved his people so much that he said, I can't stand it. If we allow the culture, with all their mishmash, wishy-washy, kind of highfalutin thinking, to come in and twist the truth of what Jesus has taught us to something else, Boy, it's really hard to hold those things in tension, isn't it? To love and yet tell the truth. Even the culture tells us that you can't put those things. If you love, you have to let somebody have their own truth. And vice versa. Now, John did that well. I think his most famous line, at least outside of the story of Jesus that he tells, he says this. You either love the world or you love the Father. If you love the world, your, your thinking gets distorted. But if you love the Father, you live by truth. If your thinking is distorted, you begin to act in corrupt ways. When you have the right kind of thinking because you love the Father, you act in the ways of the kingdom of God. If you have corrupt ways and the wrong thinking because you love the world, your end is death. But when you love the Father and follow in the footsteps of Jesus, John would say, you get more to life than you could ever imagine. Raw material. If you catch anything from James and John, catch this. Jesus didn't just like make them new people. He transformed the stuff that was already there. Instead of them longing for power, he made them servants. Instead of them puffing up their chest and being willing to take a position of authority, he taught them what it meant to be loving in all situations and to have a deep sense of truth that shaped their whole being. Pray with me as Beth comes to lead us in communion. Lord, thanks for the stories of James and John. Would you have a little bit of that splash over into my life, into our lives, that we would not do things in our own strength, but would trust you in all things. And that we would not seek climbing a ladder, climbing all over people to get somewhere, but instead learn even in the toughest circumstances to love, to speak truth, your truth, so that people might have life to the fullest. We pray this in Jesus' name.